now we can uh, move on to the next sutta. Was there any questions anyone wanted to ask before we move on? Uh, no? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, <coughs> the sentence that should not be in there. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can repeat, it's okay. Yeah, so you're asking the question is uh, which sentence uh, should be taken out, does pro may not belong o originally to the sutta, is the one which says he has severed craving, flung off the fetters, and with a complete penetration of conceit he has made an end of suffering. That whole sentence is the one which seems to have been added later on. Huh? In the Pali, it is a chechi tanha vivattaye sangyodanang samma mana man apasimaya antang akasi dukasa. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Did you, would you like to ask something? Yeah. You have, yeah? We have to have the microphone now. Yeah. Can I ask you uh, something about your talk this morning? This morning, yeah, sure. Yes. Any, any, anything, yeah. It is about uh, when you say my world. My world is 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 uh, determined by my uh, hmm. gratific, uh, my grasping, and and so on. Yeah. Does that mean when I let go of all these things, I let go of myself, my self identity? As in, um, this I'm not, this is not me, this is not mine. Well, uh, my, um, what I meant by my world is just that, I didn't really mean it quite in that way. What I meant is that uh, your experience is your world, yeah? And even Arahant has a world like that, because Arahant still has experience, so they too. What we mean by world is we don't really think in Buddhism. There's no need to think about kind of the universe outside, like galaxies and that kind of thing. That's kind of irrelevant. Uh, the only world which matters is our experience. Uh, and that is what it means. Uh, and uh, y your experience and the experience of an arahant will be related to each other, have many things in common. Uh, it will be different because, as you say, there will be no attachments there, but it will still have and Arahant will still have his world, or her world, will be how they, they, the experience that they have will be their world, yeah, in a similar kind of way. Yeah. That will be that world which then comes to an end when they eventually pass away. Yeah. That's what I meant. I didn't mean my, in the sense of uh, attachment or grasping here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Everyone has a different world, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's world is going to be slightly different, uh, but we have a lot in common, and uh, because we have a lot in common, that's why we can talk about the world. Yeah, we see many things in common. I mean, if you look at this room, we can talk about the room, and we can basically agree on how this room is built up. Yeah, and because we see a lot in common, otherwise we couldn't communicate if we saw things completely differently. So there is a kind of consensus on how the world works. Uh, yeah, very good. Did lady down there? Did you want to ask something? No, huh? two person. Uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever. It's up to you. Huh? Uh, yeah. It's actually a very simple question. That's why I didn't want to actually ask uh, on the floor. Uh -huh. um, just two things. Um, I just say that we always have to associate with good people, right? Yeah. So that we will always stay good. But then the uh, uh, question is, is it easy to find good people around? Is it easy to find good people? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. nobody is perfect, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, if one has wisdom, yeah. let's say one has been wise for a long time, and then uh, after a while decided to say, I make company with people who are not so wise, not so good, um, we, we, we may may not get uh, influenced, right? to also become unwise. So, I mean, of course, thinking about that, then I thought, uh, after hearing you, 
<laughs> so we actually have to also practice uh, the uh, what what uh, one of the four ways just now, right? To strengthen our mind, so that you can hang so around. So that we can, yeah. we just get out of that company. Yeah, yeah. that was an afterthought. Yeah, before I wanted to ask uh, you that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it, is it how easy is it to find? Wise people, that's the first question. And sometimes, you know, how, how do you, how wise are people anyway? How do you choose the right people rightly? And again, you cannot be a perfectionist. You cannot wait till you find Arahant friends. Yeah, you have to, otherwise, you will have, won't have many friends. You will be a very, very lonely person. Yeah? But um, so you try, remember that to associate with doesn't necessarily mean that you have to hang out with these good people all the time but you have a regular input from them yeah that's what we do by reading the word of the buddha is that you have a regular input from the buddha and that is often enough to kind of hold you up yeah and to kind of sustain you in daily life and then you can kind of carry on on that basis so just have a regular input from the Buddha, have a regular input from a good Dhamma talk that you find sustainable and workable, and then you have a lot of support already. And then you have the people at BGF, I mean, they're, and they're not going to be perfect, but that's okay, they don't have to be perfect. These are, everyone here are people who intend well, who want to do the right thing. That's already very, very useful, yeah? People who are kind of leaning in the right direction is a very positive thing, yeah? So, uh, just gen don't be too, try to be too perfectionist about this. Uh, just generally try to find good people. If you find gangsters, don't hang out too much with gangsters. Uh, yeah? This is one of those uh, things. Uh, and um, so uh, that, that is really what it means. You generally move in that direction, generally kind of lean towards the wise people without being too perfectionist uh, about it. Uh, and I didn't quite understand your other question, uh, but. Uh, you, it was a bit unclear to me what you were trying to say, but uh, uh, um, yeah, I was not, not sure what to say about that, uh, so just, just forget about it, yeah, okay. Yes, please, yeah. Mm. I have two questions. Mm. The first is um, about um, the compassion, loving kindness practice in our daily, daily life. Yeah. So we all know that it's a good thing to do. But loving kindness, compassion is not just towards others, but it's also towards ourselves. Mm, mm. So at which point do we draw the line where we say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, too bad, that's not my problem. Or mm. I've tried my best, you know, um, that's none of my business. Okay, then the second question um, is really basic. Uh, we talk about jhana. Yeah. So I would like to know, um, just curious, whether lay people can actually experience that or is it just um, more of a very high level, only mm. monk level can, can get that kind of experience? Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, the first one with compassion is that uh, sometimes if you take it too far and with maybe not enough wisdom, you can become very tired and you can kind of exhaust yourself and uh, you're not, as you say, not really looking after yourself. It's a balance about looking after yourself and looking after others. So don't take it too far. Know your limits. Yeah? You can only, uh, if you are going to be of help to other people, you have to have a positive mind state, you have to have the right qualities in your heart. If you get too tired, you lose all those positive qualities and it's hard to really be compassionate properly anyway. You can't really be compassionate anymore anyway because you <laughs> it becomes like an automatic thing, you become like a robot. Yeah? There's no feelings and you just do these things and then nothing really, it doesn't really have that personal feeling to it. So yes, you have to look after yourself, recharge your batteries, sit down and uh, do a bit of meditation practice to calm yourself down again and do a bit of loving kindness and to build up the good qualities and then you can go out in the world and you can kind of be helpful again based on that. Yeah? So you have to know the right time, the right place uh, and find that balance. In the balance is very important. Looking after yourself, looking after others. Ideally it goes together because if you look after others in a good way it will actually boost your ability to look after yourself because you feel good about yourself if you look after others and if you look after yourself it increases your ability to look after others so it kind of builds up on each other in that sense. Yeah. So it's a good point, it's a very important point to remember that. It's not just about giving, giving, giving and completely draining yourself, that doesn't work either. 
And about the jhana thing is that, yes, it's possible for lay people to attain jhanas. It is not easy for anyone, yeah? whether you're monastic or lay people. It may take a lot of training and development of the mind to get there. But anyone is able to do it if you put in enough sufficient of perseverance and commitment in the practice. It can be done. And often it will ha may happen at times when you go on a retreat. Uh, yes, yeah? so I go to a place like Jana Grove, for example, which is very secluded, uh, and that can be a good circumstance for these things to happen. But don't expect it. Uh, don't think about it. Don't worry about it, because you don't even know how close you are. You have no idea. And you may be many years away. So what's the point of desiring it? You desire something which may take a long time to get there. You just have no idea. Maybe you are close. I don't know. I don't know your mind, but you know. <laughs> It's just something that if we want it, but we don't really know if we have the ability, it's crazy to want something that you don't know anything about. Uh, so don't think about it. Uh, just be satisfied with what is happening in your path right now. Uh, are you improving? Uh, are the bad qualities going down? If that is happening, then you are heading in the right direction. Then the jhanas must happen eventually as a consequence. Uh, that is what matters. Uh, so focus on more the preliminaries, otherwise you actually probably more like destroying your ability to get those jhanas uh, in the first place. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Ajahn, regarding uh, metta as the meditation object, yeah. do you know whether it uh, involves a, a, a nimitta? And you mentioned that there, there's a samadhi which is like ja the jhanas, right? Yeah. So, uh, is this mentioned in the suttas? Um, <coughs> does it involve a nimitta? I th it probably does, because it's just the nature of the mind to give rise to these pictures at a certain point. The mind sees the world in a certain way when it gets really unified. So probably, yeah, I think in most cases it does. That's what I, you know, from people who have practiced this way before, that's what they tend to say. It actually goes via that stage. So, uh, uh, yes, it goes to, it goes, I think, I think it does go via that. Uh, and uh, for that reason, it's kind of almost like any other meditation object in that sense, yeah? Because you go via the nimitta, then you enter the jhana states. Uh, but because you are using metta as a way of entry, uh, that will also affect how you experience the post jhana state, uh, because you have overcome that. Uh, ill will in a much deeper sense because it has been carried through from the beginning all the way through to the jhana and then out on the other side. Uh, so yes, you would go through roughly the same process, I think. It, it wouldn't be all that different. Uh, and uh, the closer you get to the jhana, the less you're actually, you know, the, the metta actually becomes the nimitta. And uh, because the mind becomes very, very peaceful towards the end there. You can't really use your intention very much at all anymore. The mind becomes locked into the bliss. And that is the problem when you get very close to jhana. If you move the mind a little bit, uh, you lose that state. And so you have to carry, carry on through that. Uh, so it, it's the process, I think, in general, will be very much the same. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, is it in the suttas? Uh, 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 the Buddha, the way, it's interesting the way the Buddha talks about uh, um, the um, metta or the, or the uh, Brahma Viharas in the suttas. And all he just says there really is that you spread metta to the four directions. And it says, apamana, without any limit, yeah, without any ill will. So it sounds like a very, very high state straight away. Yeah? There's very little in the suttas that explains how to develop metta from the beginning all the way to the top. And the only explanation really is a kind of explanation you find in the sutta later on where it talks about, okay, you start with metta by body and speech, then you have metta in your thinking. That's really all there is. There isn't any kind of object that you use, or any particular way of thinking, apart from the fact that metta is about being kind and seeing the good qualities in people, which is obvious when you see the suttas. So it isn't explained very well in the suttas. It's more like an outcome. It seems more that metta is something you develop based on the samadhi that is practiced through anapanasati or something like that. That's what it looks like. Maybe something you do after the jhanas even. You can do metta to uh, attain even higher states. So. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, 
Now I thought we could have a look at the uh, next sutta, Removing Resentment. And uh, the idea here is that we are kind of refining and getting more and more practical as we carry along here, more and more related to real problems in our lives and how to deal with real problems. So getting more and more focused on what to do, starting with the general and becoming more and more specific. And this now is getting very, very specific and very practical. And this is one of my favorite suttas because it is touches on the problem that almost everyone has and in a very practical way. It's something that everyone can employ and if you employ this fully, uh, uh, you're going to have lots of good results in your general mental development uh, and in overcoming anger and ill will in particular. Uh, uh, removing resentment, Agata Pativinaya Sutta in the Pali language. And um, <coughs> Okay, Dutti then, Dutti Agata. Said the second, the second Agata Pativinya Sutta. <laughs> okay, there the venerable Sariputta <coughs> addressed the bhikkhus. The bhikkhus, friends, bhikkhus, friend, those bhikkhus replied, and the venerable Sariputta said this: Friends, there are five ways of removing resentment by which a bhikkhu should entirely remove resentment, in other words, ill will yeah, or anger, when it has arisen towards anyone. What five? Here a person's bodily behavior is impure, but his verbal behavior is pure. One should remove resentment towards such a person. A person's verbal behavior is impure, but his bodily behavior is is pure, one should also remove resentment towards such a person. A person's bodily behavior is <coughs> and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time he gains an opening of mind, placidity of mind. One should also remove resentment towards such a person. A person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, and he does not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind from time to time. One should also remove resentment towards such a person. A person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, and one should also remove resentment towards such a person. So that is the summary, summary of the sutta. And uh, uh, the point here, uh, yeah, first of all the point is that you should entirely remove resentment uh, by using these five ways so that no ill will or anything actually remains, that is entirely gone. This is obviously an important point. And the second important point is that these five categories uh, include all people, uh, include from the worst kind of dodgy character, uh, yeah, the one who has no good qualities, uh, to the last one, which is like the saint, the one with all pure qualities. Uh, and everything in between is part of this. Uh. So the point here, the very important point here, is that there is no, ba really no reason to have ill will towards anyone. This is what he's saying here. All ill will can be abandoned. We shouldn't have any enemies in the world. We can't afford to have enemies, because if you could die tomorrow, how can you afford to have an enemy? Uh, this is one of the great consequence of the death contemplation, you realize having enemies is just foolish. So you have to make peace with everyone in your life and, and everyone to, to, to deal with them in, uh, in one way or another. And this gives you that method for how to deal with this, or one method anyway. Uh, there obviously are well, probably are other, man, many other ways of dealing with this. Uh, and uh, remember that we have very often people will tell you that Metta is the way to overcome ill will. Yeah? There's a kind of a common way of talking about it. Uh, but it's very important to understand what we mean by metta when we overcome ill will. People think that means sitting down and doing metta meditation. But not really. That is a very advanced way and you already have to overcome ill will first before you can do metta meditation. Uh, when we say metta overcomes ill will, what we mean is changing our m mind, reflecting in a different way, 
thinking of people, seeing them in such a way that we have metta and compassion towards them. It's a reflection rather than a meditation practice. Uh, yeah, and this again shows the importance of reflection in Buddhism. There's the two powers, the power of reflection and the power of development. And first of all, we have to get the power of reflection right, uh, thinking about people in the right way. Uh, this is a very large part of doing the metta practice right. And then we can move on to meditation. And this here is really all about reflection, how to think about people. Not what we do in meditation, you can use this in meditation as well, but mostly it's about what we do outside of meditation to purify the mind, to think about the world, people in the right way here. So this is um, very useful because of this um, defilement of ill will. It's so, uh, is so common and uh, uh, so very handy to know how to deal with this. So let's start out with the first one. How, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily behavior is impure, but whose verbal behavior is pure? So one part of his behavior is impure, and other part of the behavior is pure. Suppose a rag-robed bhikkhu sees a rag by the roadside. He would press it down with his left foot, spread it out with his right foot, tear, tear off an intact section and take it away with him. So too, when a person's bodily behavior is impure, but his verbal behavior is, is pure, on that occasion one should not attend to the impurity of his bodily behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of his verbal behavior. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. It's so simple. Yeah? <coughs> the point here is that people are complex. People have lots of different sides to them. And most people have both good sides and bad sides. And certainly people here at the BGF will have, you know, have a bit of both. But it's not I difficult to see the good characteristics and people who belong to a Buddhist group like this. It's quite easy because everyone wants to do something good. Everyone is intending in the right direction. And what a wonderful thing it is to have a group of people where everyone is intending something positive. So, yeah, this is how you shift your... So if you have arguments on the committee, there was a question about that the other day, I don't know if that was the BGF committee, probably, yeah, most likely BGF committee. Yeah. <laughs> so <coughs> if you have an argument or a, something unresolved on the BGF committee, yeah, that's what you do. You remind yourself that these people on the committee, actually, they really want to do the right thing here. Yeah. But sometimes they get carried away by their emotions, or they get carried away by the argument, or by the whatever it is. And maybe they go too far, but actually they are really good people. And when you remember that, you always guide yourself back to seeing the positive in them. Yeah, This is kind of the trick here. And uh, so you stay with the positive, and you uh, allow, and you forgive the negative side in people. This is the power of this particular thing and it's very very powerful if you uh, you know if you if someone does something small that is not very nice and which irritates you but you remember that the big picture is beautiful the big picture is they're trying really hard the big picture is that they actually have a good heart they want to do what is right that is the big picture and as soon as you remember that that small thing that did was that was wrong bang it's just gone like that is irrelevant. Who cares about the small little mistake that people do when the big picture is so great? It's a very simple way. So you need to develop that ability. If there is someone in your life that you find difficult or sometimes irritating or whatever, keep on reminding yourself again and again of the good qualities of that, those people. This can be very useful for family members because in the family, when you are so close to each other, we t sometimes we get on each other's nerves, yeah? The same old things again and again and again, and then they upset you and irritate you because we are so close to each other. But at the same time, our family members are the people who are most dear to us. It's strange. On the one hand, it's difficult. On the other hand, they're most dear. It's kind of a very complex relationship. So in those situations, we, have to, we can use these kind of techniques to always remind ourselves of the good qualities that are there. They are the ones that really matter. And then forgive and let go of the bad qualities. For, don't try, for goodness sake, to change 
your family members. Yeah, that's just that, that's really the, one of the worst things. Uh, allow them to be here. Accept them for what they are. That is really the right way. Forgive the bad qualities, uh, and then appreciate the goodness that actually is available. Uh, turn your attention always to that. Uh, come back to that, that again, uh, and that is the right way of doing this. Uh. It's easy to say, yeah, but it can be difficult to do, but if you apply yourself, guarantee that it will work. Yeah. And then you have this simile here, beautiful simile that you can use to remind you how this works in practice. So a rag robed bhikkhu, these were the, in the old days when the bhikkhus just picked up rags in the roadside, you know, outside a shop, and they <coughs> picked up enough rags and eventually they could sew a robe out of those rags. That was kind of the uh, most, most basic way of having a robe at the time of the Buddha. And even today some bhikkhus practice in this way. So if you are a rag robe bhikkhu and you see a rag by the roadside, you are happy. A rag, yay! Now I can add another rag to my rag robe. So what do you do? You press down that rag with your left foot and you spread it out with your right foot. Why do you do that? And the reason you do that is because you want to get an overview of the rag. Yeah, you pull it down and you pull it down and you get an overview and you see what's going on. And then when you see what's going on, you say, well, there's this part is good, that part is no good. Yeah, just like a person. With a person, you kind of take all the qualities of the person and you kind of spread out the whole spectrum of qualities in your mind and you see the good ones and you see the bad ones. It's a similar kind of way you understand a person and all their qualities. And then when you have spread out the rag on the, on the ground, you tear off the bad part. What do you do with the bad part which is torn off? Do you take it with you or do you chuck it out? You chuck it out. Yeah, It's rubbish. It's garbage. It's junk. I don't know what the word is in Malaysia, but one of those words would probably do the job. Yeah, It's bad stuff. That's even a more general word. It's bad. So you, in the same way, rubbish, Yeah, in the same way with the qualities of another person. Yeah, The negative qualities in the mind, they are rubbish. Yeah, I don't want to carry them with you. The Buddha said before, it's like the sna carcass of a snake around your neck. You don't want to have a carcass of a snake around your neck. You take those qualities, chuck them out, gone. Yeah, <laughs> And then you allow them to be incinerated by whatever, and then they disappear once and for all. It's rubbish. Remember that. It defiles your mind. That's why it is rubbish. Defiling literally means, that's what rubbish does. Yeah, It defiles things, it pollutes things, and it makes things bad. So that's how you look at it, and you throw it out. And then you take the remaining good qualities. You take that cloth, the rag robiku takes the cloth, puts it in his little bag or whatever, and carries that cloth with him. To then bring it to wherever he wants, then he can sew a robe in the future. That's good. In the same way, you take those good qualities in the people you know. You take those qualities, take them into your heart, and you carry that with you into the future. That is what you remember. You place them into your mind, into the little shelf in your mind. Say, uh, uh, my friend so-and-so, yeah, whoever that is, I don't know who, who that is, Dr. Wee maybe, he's not here, so we can, Dr. Wee, my friend Dr. Wee has all these beautiful qualities, so put that little shelf, tick in there, Dr. Wee good qualities, yeah, and then you have someone else over here, tick in there, and then you kind of feel something like that, yeah, w whatever it is. Uh, and you take those with you because they are good. They add something to your life. They make your life better. Yeah, these are positive things that we uh, remember and we carry with us because they will be useful in the future. If you ever have ill will towards whoever that person is, you bring those qualities out from that little shelf in your mind. Just a metaphor, of course. And uh, then you use that to counteract the problem. And the problem, dung, gone like that, uh, if you do this properly. Yeah. So it's rubbish. Yeah, and this is the uh, kind of the trick behind this. Uh, and um, sometimes people say, and this is an, a very, it's an interesting, I think, an important point to understand what is going on here. Sometimes people say, "But is this really being realistic? If we don't, if we throw out all the bad qualities and we uh, don't look at the good qualities, aren't we just deluding ourselves?" 
Aren't people complex? Don't they have all kind of sides, bad and good sides? Is it right just to look at the right sides? Aren't we supposed to see reality as it actually is? Aren't we, here, aren't we deluding ourselves? And this is exactly a very interesting point, because the point is that there isn't any objective reality in the first place. It's not as if you will ever be able to know a person for who they are, because they aren't even stable themselves. Yeah, They're always moving around. One day they are more pure, one day they are worse. Maybe over a lifetime they change for the better or they change for the worse. Who are they in the first place? You can't even say who they are in the first place. So how can you have an accurate appreciation of them? It's impossible. If you look at one person, <coughs> One person who is their friend will say, oh, they are wonderful. Another person who is their enemy will say, they are terrible. Who is right? None of them is right. Yeah, There's just different perceptions that arise inside of us. So there is no true perception of another person. Because there is no true perception, it's the wrong way of thinking about the problem. Instead of asking ourselves to find the true perception, we should ask ourselves, what is the useful perception? What is the perception that leads us forward on the path? That is the question that matters the most. Uh, a useful perception will be one whereby you are aiding yourself, moving forward on the path. Uh, yeah? And that is what this is all about. And a useful perception is always to see the good qualities in people. Yeah? It is such a powerful thing. Yeah? And I know that because I, you know, when you live with Ajahn Brahm, he's very good at seeing the good qualities in people around him. Really, really good. Uh, and actually, it tends to encourage you uh, to actually be kind and to be a good person when you are around someone who always sees the good qualities in you. Huh? Because you want to live up to their standard. You want to kind of do what is right when someone has places so much confidence in you. Huh? So when someone does that, sees the good qualities in you, it tends to lift everyone's game. And it is useful for you at the same time. Of course, deep down, you also know that they have, may have some negative qualities. Yeah? So you know that, but you forgive those because you also understand that the habits of human beings are very, uh, you know, are very kind of uh, broad and, and this is what we bring with us from the past. And it sense you have a compassion for those negative qualities because you understand this is part of the human nature. So you remember that so that you don't also don't allow yourself to be taken for uh, you know, for granted or being abused or anything like that. That would also be going too far, just seeing good qualities and then allowing yourself to suffer because of that. That also is no good. So you remember the good qualities. You know that there are some, maybe some potentially bad qualities lurking there, but you tend to forgive that because you know that this is just human nature. And you, generally speaking, you focus on those good qualities. Yeah? That is what you remember, that's what you focus on. You forget the bad ones because that's rubbish anyway. And then you are kind of heading on the right track. Then you're moving in the right direction here. It's very simple. Yeah? It's super simple, but it takes practice to be able to do it. It's the practice part that is the hard part in these things. The commitment and persevering with it, that is actually what is harder. So, what does it mean that um, his, you know, his bodily behavior is impure, but his verbal behavior is pure? What is this point about bodily and verbal behavior? And the point there is, I don't think there's much point to that. It's just that this is an oral tradition uh, sutta, so they use some kind of simple system to talk about this, but just means that you have some good qualities, you have some bad qualities, wherever they are. That's really all it means. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it means anything more than that. Uh, so let's have a look at the second one. Uh, how, friends, should resentment be removed? towards a person whose verbal behavior is impure, but whose bodily behavior is pure. Suppose there is a pond covered with algae and water plants. A man might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. He would plunge into the pond, sweep away the algae and water plants with his hands, drink from his cupped hands and then leave. So too, when a person's verbal behavior is impure, but his bodily behavior is pure. On that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of his verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of his bodily behavior. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. 
So this is very similar to the previous one, except that now the good qualities and the bad ones are in a different place. So sometimes people change, so you have to kind of follow along and change along with them and, and kind of reset your uh, reset these um, perceptions a little bit. Uh, the main difference here is that the uh, simile is different. Uh, yeah, so a pond covered with algae and water plants, the pond symbolizes the good qualities, the pure water underneath. Uh, the algae and the water plants symbolizes the bad qualities in that person. Uh, and then this other man comes along, afflicted and oppressed by the heat. This means that you are angry, yeah, you have ill will. This is by being oppressed by the heat. Uh, and you are weary, you're weary because you're tired, because um, anger tires you out in the long run. Uh, and you are thirsty in the sense you are looking for a solution, yeah, uh, to that problem. Uh, you have probably have cravings and things and you're looking for the solution. Uh, parched, again, it means you are a bit hot. Uh, and uh, so you are trying to find a, a solution. And the way to find that solution is as follows. Uh, you plunge into the pond, sweep away those bad qualities, get rid of that algae and water plants. Uh, don't want to see those negative qualities. Instead, uh, you drink from the pure, beautiful qualities underneath. Uh, yeah, And you drink that water in. You drink in those good qualities. You take them into your heart. Uh, and of course, you really carry them with you when you take them in, in such a deep way. Uh, and you remember the good qualities and you let go of the, uh, the bad ones. Uh, so there is this mix here of focusing on the good qualities, uh, taking those with you, and also of understanding and letting go of anything bad that you might see. Making a lot out of the big ones and minimizing the small ones. Uh, that is a lot what this is about. Uh, Number three, <coughs> how, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily behavior is, bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but who from time to time gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind. Suppose there is a little water in a puddle. Then a person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. He would think, this little bit of water is in the puddle. If I try to drink it with my cupped hands or a vessel, I will stir it up, disturb it and make it undrinkable. Let me get down on all fours, suck it up like a cow and depart. He then gets down on all four, four, sucks the water up like a cow, and he departs. So too, when a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time against an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, on that occasion one should not attend to the impurity of the bodily or verbal behavior, but instead attend to the opening of the mind, the placidity of mind he gains from time to time. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So here is a person with only a tiny bit of good qualities. Yeah, he speaks badly and he, he acts badly, but he does gain this placidity of mind, this opening of the mind from time to time. What does that mean? And uh, the, op the word for opening of the mind here is the vivarana, is the opposite of the nivarana. Nivarana is the five hindrances, yeah? They're called nivarana. This is the opposite of the five hindrances, the vivarana. So it means that occasionally you get a little bit of liberation from those five hindrances, especially the most oppressive aspects of them, which is the two first ones. They are the, uh, the real kind of uh, uh, torturers of the five hindrances, uh, ill will and uh, desires. So you Occasionally, you get some freedom from those five hindrances. This is the vivarana, and then the mind becomes peaceful. It becomes placid. Placid means peaceful. Yeah, the lake where the water is really flat and easy. Lake placid. It's actually a lake placid in the. Uh, that was the Olympic Games, I think, in 1984 or something like that. That was Lake Placid. Uh, but um, I'm sure that lake is nowhere near as placid as. Uh, uh, some of these mind states, they're much more placid when you get there. 
So uh, there are people who have good qualities. Yeah, you, sometimes they are almost invisible, uh, and you have to look very careful. Uh, and then you see the good qualities in people. You really have to use the microscope to find those good qualities, uh, because they are they are there, hidden where, behind the scenes sometimes. Uh. So you bring out your microscope or your telescope and then focus in and find those good qualities in the people. Uh. So that is a very interesting point. The Buddha says we should go to a very high, uh, go very far to try to see good qualities in people. That's really what he's saying, he's saying here. Even though the verbal and bodily behavior is bad, usually when someone has bad verbal and bodily behavior, you try to get away from them already. It feels really you know, uncomfortable to be around them. But the Buddha says yeah, we should really try to see if there's something else going on. So here is a person who still has some ability in meditation, perhaps, or peaceful mental states, and that is all there is left to focus on. And if they are there, we should do that. And then he has this beautiful simile about the uh, uh, cow, yeah, the cow simile. You, uh, you have to be very careful because the water in the puddle is only a tiny little bit of good qualities. Uh, and if you are not careful, if you are, don't go down and focus very narrowly on that water, uh, like the cow gets down on all fours and suck it up directly, if you, then you will just stir it up. Uh, and the same thing with this person, if you look a little bit far too much to one direction, one another direction, you will see the bad qualities and you will stir up the good qualities, you will mix them up with the bad ones uh, and you won't be able to focus narrowly down on those good qualities. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is that this person sometimes gets some good meditation, yeah? They may, be, they may not be very friendly, they may be a bit difficult to deal with, but Actually, it's amazing that actually they're getting something out of this life, getting some good qualities. Uh, and you rejoice in the good qualities in someone who is really difficult. Uh, hard to do, but the point here, it can be done if you put your mind to it. Uh, yeah? You try to avoid stirring up, mudding those good qualities by remembering the bad ones. Uh. So why is it uh, that the Buddha puts so much emphasis on this, on seeing the good qualities? What is going on? Uh, why is this so important? And uh, the, I think the reason why it is important is because uh, in the suttas you have four Brahma Viharas. Yeah? You have the Metta, Karuna, Mudita and Upeka. And Metta being loving kindness and the Karuna being the compassion, uh, Mudita altruistic joy and then Upeka being the even-minded or equanimity. Yeah? Now the, of those four the best one, the easiest one, yeah, it may sound really harsh, but the easiest one is metta, difficult enough already, but that is the easiest one. Uh, and the one that can never really go wrong. Why can't it go wrong? And the reason is because with metta, we're always looking at the good qualities in other people. Uh, and when you look at the good qualities in other people, uh, it is always going to have a good result. Uh, there cannot be, there's no side effects, no negative side effects with seeing the good qualities in other people. It only leads to positive results. So metta is quite easy and it cannot really, it's very hard for that practice to go wrong. Maybe it can if you do something really extreme, but generally, you know, anything can go wrong if you are extreme enough, but uh, basically it can't go wrong. Karuna, compassion, is more difficult. It's more difficult because when you have compassion for others, uh, it is a wish to reduce their suffering. Uh, so it is very closely related to suffering. Uh, so when you try to be compassionate, it's very easy that you can veer into feeling a lot of suffering in the world, yeah? experience all the suffering that these people are experiencing. Uh, and sometimes people talking about having terrible meditations by doing compassion where they lose all the energy because really what they're focusing on is suffering and it just wears you down and it drains your energy because you don't really understand how to apply the mind properly. You're getting it wrong. It's easy to get compassion wrong. It's much more difficult to get metta wrong. And this is why I think the Buddha here emphasizes the idea of metta, to, or Venerable Sariputta emphasizes the idea of metta along way down the track. Always try to use that, if at all possible, even when there are only a few good qualities in a person. Yeah, so compassion is, uh, sometimes we need to use compassion because there is not much choice, but it's really a tool that is more difficult to use properly than metta. Metta is more easy, it can't really 
backfire so easily. Huh? Too much seeing, too much suffering causes suffering in you at the same time. It drains your energy and makes life difficult. Huh? So that is really the uh, kind of message in that particular passage there. Huh? Now let's come to the fourth one. Huh? <coughs> And how, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure and who does not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, from time to time? So here is someone with no good qualities. Okay, so this is where it gets interesting. Suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway. Here and the last village behind, behind him and the next village ahead of him were both far away. He would not obtain suitable food and medicine or a qualified attendant. He would not get to meet the leader of the village district. Another man traveling along the highway might see him and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern for him, thinking, Oh, may this man obtain suitable food, suitable medicine, and a qualified attendant. May he get to meet the leader of the village district. For what reason? So that this man does not encounter calamity and disaster right there. Calamity just means death. Yeah, that's what it means basically here. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure and he does not gain from time to time an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, uh, on that occasion one should arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern for him, thinking, Oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehavior and develop good bodily behavior. May he abandon verbal misbehavior and develop good verbal behavior. May he abandon mental misbehavior and develop good mental behavior. For what reason? So that with the breakup of the body after death, he will not be reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So here you have no choice. You cannot do metta towards someone who has no good qualities because you metta relies on the fact of seeing good qualities in somebody. So if you cannot do metta, you have to have an alternative approach. And this is where compassion comes in. So this is the compassion practice that you see here. Yeah? This is what it is about. So uh, uh, this is where it, uh, yeah, it starts to happen. So, um, how does this work? And how this works, and it's very interesting, that someone who has all these bad qualities, they are like a sick person. Yeah, so this is how you regard them. They are ill. They, have, they are in the sense that when you are sick, and especially if you are uh, sick in this way that is described here, you're walking on a desert road, there's nobody to support you, uh, you're walking towards a terrible future, you're about to die, you cannot, there's no way out of this, uh, you are in a terrible position. Uh, and you can imagine that some of what some of these things are, yeah, the, the medicine is probably a bit like the Eightfold Path, uh, and the uh, uh, village leader probably a bit like the Buddha, qualified attendant by maybe that's kind of a, some of the sangha maybe the monks and the nuns maybe who are well practiced like the aryas or whatever and these are the people who can support you and guide you in the right direction so that you don't die and you don't have a serious problem they're like the nurses who feed you yeah so so what is going on here you are sick because you don't really understand about reality you have no idea what is happening on happening here you are deluded you are walking in darkness you are making enormous amount of bad come for yourself by acting badly by body speech and mind and you're only heading in one direction for a negative rebirth in the future and you don't even understand that you have no idea that's what you're doing so this is the right approach when someone in your life is really difficult, the reason is because they are blind. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, someone who has all bad qualities, they are really in a seriously bad state. They are acting for their own disaster and suffering in the future. Nobody 
freely will act for their own suffering. Nobody freely will be their own enemy in that way. The only reason you do that is because you haven't got a clue what you're doing. So this is what delusion is all about. When someone is that deluded, there's only one rational outcome, to have compassion for them. How can you not have compassion for someone when they are destroying themselves? Yeah, they are sick. Someone who is bad is sick, basically, in a very deep and profound sense. So when you see bad people doing bad things, remember that. They are sick. Yeah? They are really worthy of compassion because they have no idea they are causing suffering for others, but far more suffering for themselves than they are for anyone else. Uh, they are destroying their own lives much faster than they are destroying the lives of people around them. Uh, and then instead of getting angry with it, you understand that samsara is this terrible place where we are all causing suffering for each other uh, without really understanding what we are doing. Uh. Yeah, it's kind of sad. One person creates suffering for another person, thinking that they are making happiness for themselves, but actually creating suffering for themselves in the process. Uh, it's sort of uh, madness that is going on in this world. Uh, so you have to have compassion for everyone, for the victim, but also for the perpetrator, because the victim suffers, but the perpetrator suffers probably more. So then you have compassion for both. Uh, and you remember that these people, all they are doing is that they are just working out of habit, working out of delusion, working because of this programming that has been laid down into them in the past. They are just like these robots being trapped by robothood and programming and cannot actually get out of this uh, uh, misconception of uh, what it is like to live, uh, live well. And this is the problem. And then compassion comes almost automatically. Yeah? How can you not have compassion for such a person? So this is the trick. If somebody is uh, unpleasant to you, to your face, yeah? directly to your face, very close to you, that is a time to remember these things. Yeah? Because that, if you can remember that at that time, then you can be completely cool if someone is upset with you. And that's incredibly powerful, if you can be really, not just superficially cool, but cool inside, in your heart. Uh, when someone is being angry and upset with you, uh, it has a very powerful effect at defusing the situation. Uh, because if you are really cool, the other person starts to become very self-conscious. Uh, yeah? If you are angry with someone, but there's no reaction in the other person, very quickly you start to see yourself, and you see your own problem. Uh, if the other person reacts, then you are you get this kind of back and forth thing and you don't really see your own problem anymore. But if you were to get angry with Ajahn Brahm, try that one day, get angry with Ajahn Brahm and see what happens. I guarantee you, no reaction. He would just look at you as if you're a little bit crazy or something, but he's not going to say anything. And very quickly you will become self-conscious. You think, mm, what am I saying? What am I doing? Yeah? So the, a person who is uh, noble like that becomes a mirror to other people and you help other people to see themselves. Uh, it's very, very powerful uh, and very useful. So it is the right way and then they will actually learn much faster. If you act with anger back, they won't learn anything at all, probably. Uh, but if you stay really cool, then they might actually learn something about their own bad behavior. Uh, it's, these things are very powerful things. Uh, and. Uh, incredibly useful in practice, because we all have to deal with people in our lives that sometimes are difficult. This is the right way. Of course, I'm not suggesting that we should always be in a place where other people say bad things to us. That's also not useful. Yeah, we should uh, sometimes we need to get away from difficult people. But if you have no choice, then uh, this is how you deal with the situation. They are sick. They're walking in darkness, uh, and remember that. You're taking, it is no longer personal, yeah? You take away the personal clash uh, between two people, and you make it into something neutral, uh, and you turn the table around, uh, and instead of it uh, uh, getting angry about things, uh, you have compassion. Instead of being self-centered about yourself, uh, you broaden your mind out, and you have compassion for the world, uh, and that is the right way of dealing with that. Uh. So, um, maybe, maybe I should stop there, because it's nice, we can do the last, there's one last one. The last one is very nice, because the last one is the saint, the beautiful person, and how to deal with anger when you get angry with a, someone very saintly. So that's kind of a nice one, maybe to do tomorrow. 
I must admit my mind is getting a bit blurred now, so if I continue talking I will <laughs> I will have a problem. So uh, let's uh, have a short break and then if you want to, let's have a half an hour of meditation in, uh, at about 5.30.